Welcome everyone to this webinar from the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools. Our focus today is infectious disease focused methods and tools to support evidence informed decision making. So I'm glad you could all join us. My name is Susan Snelling and I am a Senior Knowledge Translation Specialist at NCCMT or the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools. And I have a colleague with me today from a sister NCC who can introduce herself right now. Hello everyone. My name is Margaret Howarth Brockman. I am the Senior Program Manager at the National Collaborating Center for Infectious Diseases. So we're pleased to be talking with all of you today. We are assisted today by Rowan Farron, um, who's uh, perhaps behind the scenes but making all this magic happen. So thanks everyone for being here. We have a question for you and um, you'll see the poll come up in the lower right hand corner. So I think you know what to do. You can click away and just tell us whether you're watching uh, today's webinar solo or whether you have company. So um, lots of people solo, but um, certainly some people in small groups and um, a couple are in large groups of six to ten or even more than ten. So um, welcome to all of you and again, thanks for being here. Just a couple of notes about um, how the webinar will work today. The teleconference line will be muted during the webinar, so um, you'll hear us, but we won't hear you. If you do have a comment, though, or a question, we really would love to hear from you. And you can use the Q&A box, which is on the right of your screen, to post comments and questions during the webinar. And you can feel free to send your questions to all so everyone can see them, because there may be other people on the call who either have the same question or have something to add, or maybe can answer your question for you. So uh, we appreciate your input uh, using the Q&A box. There's some notes there if you're having trouble connecting, uh, but we hope that you're all hearing us well now. So another question for you, just to give us a sense of where people are calling from today. So give us um, a little feel for where you're calling in from. So we have participants from British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Um, from outside Canada as well, so welcome to you for coming all this way virtually. Great, thanks so much. It's great to have that coverage um, pretty much across the country. So today um, we will give a brief introduction to the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools and the National Collaborating Center for Infectious Disease. And then um, the focus of our webinar will be a model for evidence-informed decision-making, so how to find and use evidence um, that can help in making good decisions. And we'll walk through some steps in that process. Our focus today, though, will be particularly uh, with reference to methods and tools that are relevant for people who practice in infectious disease areas. And our particular focus today will be um, evidence that can guide decisions about tuberculosis and um, bringing social determinants context into that. Um, now, the model that we're going to talk about with respect to evidence-informed decision-making may be familiar to you if you've been exposed to our work at NCCMT before. So we're looking at methods and tools for evidence-informed decision-making. Um, sometimes, though, when we talk about our um, model for evidence-informed decision-making in a general sense, we get a question as to whether these tools can apply to infectious disease contexts because there are some um, different ways that these diseases emerge and are treated. Um, but our answer is yes, this model does apply. And 
in particular, there are some methods and tools that are really well suited to infectious disease applications. And that's going to be our focus today. Some of the tools will be uh, fairly generic, but certainly applying to infectious disease. And some will be uh, quite specific to infectious disease. Now, you may also have great tools to share. So um, in the Q&A box, you're also welcome just to um, mention tools that have helped you to use evidence effectively in your work. It can be a good opportunity for sharing as well. So we'd be happy to hear from you on that score. So a little bit now about the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools, or NCCMT. Um, the vision of NCCMT is that the effectiveness and efficiency of Canada's public health system will be guided by the production and sharing and use of high quality evidence. And our focus is to enhance evidence informed public health practice and policy in Canada by providing leadership and expertise in supporting the uptake of what works in public health into practice. So our focus really is on that aspect of what works. We call that evidence-informed public health. So that process of distilling and disseminating the best available evidence from research and from context and from experience and using that evidence to inform and improve public health policy and practice. So evidence-informed public health is a systematic approach to incorporating research evidence into program and policy decisions. A really simple way of thinking about it is that it's finding and using and sharing what works in public health. So another question for you, um, what sector are you from? Probably many of you are um, coming from the public health world, but I think we probably have some people from other areas as well. Yes, public health people, research, um, other areas of health. Welcome, everybody. Uh, municipalities, uh, federal or provincial governments, NGOs, right across the board here. Um, so thank you um, to everyone. And um, I think we'll have something for all of you. And really, we, um, we do welcome your comments and questions in the Q&A box if there are particular aspects of this that come out given the context that you're working in. Now, a little bit more about the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools, and in particular, what we call the Registry of Methods and Tools. The registry is available online, and you have the link there. This is a registry of knowledge translation methods and tools for public health. So these are resources that can help you to use research evidence effectively in the work that you do. And the tools and methods that we'll be talking about in today's webinar are all available and described in the registry of methods and tools. So if um, it, we're going to give you all the links today, but if for some reason you're thinking, oh, she talked about that tool um, in the registry, but I can't quite remember, go to the registry, search by a couple of keywords, and you'll find it. And there's lots more there, too, so I would encourage you to poke around a little bit on the registry. This is what it looks like. So. Um, on the left-hand side, sort of in the middle, search the registry will allow you to get right into it, um, and you'll find lots of methods and tools for knowledge translation. So when I talk about methods and tools, which I tend to just run it all together, methods and tools, there is a distinction, though. Methods are um, a process or a series of steps. Um, so a framework, for example, could be a method. And frameworks, of course, can be really helpful in thinking about um, what you're doing in terms of using and uh, transferring knowledge. And the tool is more like an instrument um, to help you to do the task 
um, helps you um, focus on a way to do the task. So a checklist, for example, um, some sort of planning approach can be a method and or can be a tool. Sorry. So slight distinction between these, but I'll tend to talk about methods and tools pretty simultaneously. Now I'll turn over to my colleague to talk about the, the work that they do at their center. Thanks, Susan. So the National Collaborating Center for Infectious Diseases is, as Susan mentioned, a sister center. Uh, there are, in fact, six National Collaborating Centers for Public Health. And like uh, the NCC for Methods and Tools, our main audience are people who are practicing and doing research in the public health related fields. And our uh, mandate is to help public health practitioners find, understand, and then make good use of evidence and other research that's related to infectious diseases for their application in public health. We do that directly by providing resources, often ones that have been requested by people like yourselves, and also forging connections, so helping people find each other, uh, providing meetings, places to discuss certain topics in depth. So recent examples would be that we have held um, workshops on the outbreaks of syphilis. There's another one coming up in the fall. And we have had uh, meetings about using mathematical models for making um, predictions and planning for uh, outbreaks and influenza, for example. Um, our website is at nccid.ca, or equally easy to remember is centerinfection.ca, which works both in English and French. And there you will find a number of topics that we uh, currently are working on, and we invite you to also have a look at the resources that we currently have or to participate in some of the discussions that we have. Thanks, Susan. Thank you, Margaret. And thanks for um, sharing this with me today. So um, I made reference to a model for evidence-informed decision-making in public health, and here it is. So. Um, when we're thinking about using evidence to make decisions in public health, we certainly want to think about what the research says. And that's the purple circle in the bottom left. And that's mostly the focus of what we're going to talk about today, how to use research when we're making decisions. But we absolutely recognize that decisions in public health about what to do or what not to do are based not only on what the research says, but also on other components, like what's going on in the local community, um, how important is this issue or this disease right here. It might be important somewhere else, but what's our local context? What preferences do people have for taking action? Are there um, things that have been tried previously that people don't? believe would work again? Um, are there particular enthusiasms to take a particular approach? Those can come into your decision making too. Public health resources, so both in terms of expertise of how to do things and also money. Can we afford to do particular initiatives? And all of that kind of comes together along with our public health expertise. We don't leave our brains at the door and we don't leave our history at the door when we're trying to make decisions about what to do. So we also consider what our expertise tells us about where to focus, what is likely to work, and so on. So research, which is going to be the focus of uh, what we'll talk about, is certainly an important piece of evidence-informed decision making. But it's not the only thing. And we'll come back to this model toward the end of the webinar to talk about how we bring in some of these contextual pieces when we're making decisions. Now here's another um, figure, and this one will be really the structure of most of the rest of the webinar today. So this is what we call the evidence-informed public health wheel. And it illustrates the steps involved in evidence-informed practice. It's a guide for practitioners and decision makers to determine how to address a particular issue by systematically incorporating research evidence in the decision-making process. 
and we'll be looking at methods and tools for each step around this wheel that are relevant for people who work in infectious disease areas. So we have a scenario, and I'll ask Margaret just to introduce the scenario that's going to guide the discussion that we have for the rest of the webinar. Thanks. You're going to switch the slide? Yeah. I have it up as scenario. Yeah, you do now. <laughs> Uh, so, just as an example, by way of example, so that uh, it becomes a bit more applicable for you in using these resources and tools that Susan's describing, we imagine that some of you will be involved in um, providing prevention and control treatment and outreach for people who may have be at risk for or already have tuberculosis. And um, although we often think of tuberculosis as a, a real concern in rural and remote, remote parts of Canada, we also know that there are people who are either arriving from somewhere else or from the north um, or who, have, uh, who make their homes somehow in the inner city. So for this purpose, we're just going to think about tuberculosis among inner city residents, um, wherever that residency might be, and appropriate screening for them as well as outreach and uh, use that as sort of the basis for how we go about applying the tools that Susan's describing. This is of course just an example at a high level and uh, once you really get into the topic you'll want to find all the right documents to support your work. Right, and that's a um, fair warning for anyone who's participating here. Um, this webinar is not about the findings of the evidence in this area. So if you have a question about what's the best intervention related to um, tuberculosis and screening, you won't know the answer to that by the end of this webinar. But what you will know is a process so that you can find and appraise and use the evidence yourself um, on this topic or another topic that's of interest for you. So our focus here is on the process, how do we find and use and apply evidence, um, and we're using this scenario as, um, as a way to focus the discussion and to illustrate um, with some examples, um, but our focus is not so much on um, finding answers specific to TB, but you'll be able um, to, to do that using these methods and tools once we're done. So it's the wheel uh, and it turns. And the implications of this being a wheel is that you don't always have to start in one place. I'm going to start by talking about the defined step. Um, it is a logical place to start, but if you're um, in the middle of making a decision, there are places that you can enter the wheel at any point and um, so don't feel that you, uh, you're, you're coming to this too late. You can start anywhere around the wheel that makes sense for your context. But for the purposes of explaining it, we'll focus on the defined step. And at the defined step of the uh, evidence-informed public health process, what we're trying to do is really just clearly define the question or problem that we're engaged with. And um, an approach that we suggest for that one is um, to use PICO. PICO stands for Population, Intervention, Comparison, and Outcome. So this is a good basic structure just to help people to really define what evidence they would be most interested in identifying from the research literature. So we just talked about the scenario that we'll be using. So if you were to apply our scenario um, to this approach and say, well, what would our PICO be? The population that we would be interested in are inner city residents. Um, the intervention is screening. The comparison group, um, in this case, we would say that the comparison is either the intervention compared to no intervention or maybe compared to usual care. And then the outcome that we would be interested in is 
does the intervention produce more diagnosed patients in care? And I haven't mentioned here specifically tuberculosis, but of course that's part of the scenario too. So using PICO as a way to break down your, um, the definition of your question really helps to um, focus where you're going to look for evidence and the kind of evidence that you're looking for so that you get lots of what we call hits um, in the next uh, step when we're actually looking for data. Now, um, if your question is more of a qualitative question, sometimes we just use the acronym PS, which stands for population and situation. So if, um, if you're if this sort of feels a little bit too clinical, perhaps PS would help you as well. But for the scenario that we have, PICO works quite well. And if you want to use PICO to get started using evidence, um, there's a tool, the link is there, and um, it, the tool is called Developing an Efficient Search Strategy Using PICO. And you can use it to develop your search question using this format. The link will take you to um, the resource link on the registry that I spoke about. This is what the tool actually looks like. So you'll see PICO across the top, population, intervention, comparison, and outcomes. So the tool just prompts you to fill in some gaps in terms of what you know about what you want to learn. Um, and it gives you some specifics about what should actually go in that box. Now you'll see on the left that it asks about a clinical question. It certainly works really well for clinical questions, but if you're working more in um, an applied setting, a health promotion setting, it works equally well for that. So um, don't be concerned that it's talking about clinical questions. It works for that and other things too. So this can be a just a nice tool to help you structure your search or your query. And that gets us ready for the second step that we'll talk about, which is the search step. So at this point in our process of evidence-informed health, we want to search efficiently for research evidence. And I really emphasize that um, aspect of efficient because in the work that we do, which is focused on public health um, across all the NCCs, we recognize that people are busy, that your day job is probably not just searching for evidence. It's actually um, applying that evidence and delivering programs, developing policy, working with populations, and so on. So you don't have a lot of time to search for the evidence, and there are ways that you can do it well and quickly, and I'm going to show you what some of those approaches are. Here's one of the tools that we recommend for this step, um, the searching step, and that is um, these pyramids, and I'm going to show you what it looks like in a moment. These search pyramids, and you can find the links there, are pre-populated with good sites, databases, and so on for finding evidence in public health for certain specific topics. Um, so you want to start at the top of a pyramid for the most synthesized evidence. And that's really key to, um, to being efficient about what you're doing. Going to the most synthesized evidence saves you time and it ensures that you're getting a systematic approach to your searching as opposed to just finding things at random and missing other things and not really being confident that you found um, the most relevant and, and done something complete. So when I'm talking about synthesized evidence, it means that someone else has done some of the work for you of pulling things together so that you don't have to read every study, but you're finding something that someone else has done the work to synthesize or summarize. And we'll see in a moment what that might look like. So here's what the pyramids look like. Um, and there are pyramids here. This is the one for 
general sites that are good for finding evidence in public health. There are also um, pyramids that you can find on the NCCMT website for mental health, injury prevention, health communication, environmental health, healthy habits for adults, healthy habits for children. And so if any of those topics um, is an area that you work in as well, uh, check out those uh, topic-specific pyramids. But they all have some similarities. They talk about good sites where you can find evidence in particular categories. The key with, this, with the pyramid, and it's called 6S pyramid because they all start with us. The key is to start at the top. So if you're looking for the most synthesized evidence, it will be in um, evidence for systems. Now, unfortunately, in public health, we don't really have a lot of evidence that is a system. So um, just to give you an idea what that would be, um, it exists for some aspects of clinical medicine. So a system would take into account all the research evidence, all the um, data that's known about a particular patient, um, put that all together and come out with a guide for the treatment approach that would be most suitable for that person. We don't have that kind of evidence very much in public health, but we do have summaries. So when you think about a practice guideline, for example, that's a summary. It's pulled together all the available evidence and it gives you some recommendations, some guidelines, some next steps, tells you what a best practice is. So if you're looking for summaries, on the right of the pyramid, you'll see that the National Guideline Clearinghouse is one of those good sites. Um, and we're going to take a look at the National Guideline Clearinghouse in just a moment. The other thing I want to point out about how these pyramids work is that there are lots of sites, and if we were doing this live, we could scroll down even further. Um, there is a distinction here on the top of the list between sites that have been pre-appraised. So when you go there, you know that someone else has already done the work of appraising the quality of that evidence. So in other words, was the research done in a good way without bias that you can trust the results that came from it? Someone has pre-appraised. Now, you'll see that big orange band kind of toward the bottom. Sites that are below that orange band may be perfectly good. We're not saying that they're not, but you will have to do the appraisal of the evidence that you'll find on those sites because it hasn't already been done. So you can just see at the bottom there the Canadian Best Practices Portal from the um, Public Health Agency of Canada. This can be a good site for best practices, but you can't be assured of the quality, so you would need to do that appraisal yourself. And conveniently, one of the steps in our process is appraisal, so I'll share some tools if you find that you need to do appraisal yourself. So that's kind of the overview of how these pyramids work. Um, if we were to follow then the National Guidelines Clearinghouse link and go to that site, um, here's what it would look like. And it's a little bit small. Don't worry about being able to read it. You can go and look for yourself. But I just wanted to give you a sense of what happens when you go to this National Guidelines Clearinghouse. And um, you'll see at the top that um, I've entered in the word tuberculosis just as a place to start our search. And um, we get 52 hits. Um, now, I will say that in using the National Guideline Clearinghouse, I find that it's quite generous in its hits. So um, you'll see, you'll probably see if you were to look down the list, some um, guidelines that you would say, I don't really see how this is relevant or it doesn't seem super relevant. Um, and, and that's, it's, um, it's just one of the 
aspects of this using this site, you'll get probably more than you were looking for, um, which is okay. You just have to be a little bit choosy. So if we were to go to this site and just do this search on tuberculosis, um, the very first one that we get there is called Systematic Screening for Active Tuberculosis, Principles and Recommendations. And this uh, is a 2013 release. It comes from the World Health Organization. Um, so just given the scenario that we have, probably that would be one that would be relevant for us. There are probably others on that list that would be relevant for us, and some others that we would say that's not what we were looking for. So you're always going to be in a situation where you get maybe a little more than what you were looking for. In this case, um, I won't do a more specific search, but if, for example, I um, put in my keyword and I got 300 results, that's probably too much for me to feel like I could go through systematically and really be fair to everything that's there. So I would probably then go back and um, do an advanced search. So if you look right below the keyword where I have tuberculosis, there's also a link there for advanced search. And then I would start to bring in other terms from my PICO question. I might bring in um, something that was specific to homeless population. Or I might say something that I'm only looking for things specific to screening. So I can narrow it down to get only the pieces that I want. Now I'm going to ask Margaret from the infectious disease perspective, you know, just as a starting place, if we were to say, okay, we're looking for evidence because we have this particular interest, the scenario that we're working with, um, and this is where we start our search at the top of the pyramid, um, what would be um, some of the things that you would think about in terms of getting these results um, working through that scenario? Well, I think what we need to keep in mind, which is often the case when we think of infectious diseases and public health planning and programming, is that there's a real crossover between the clinical care and primary care and the public health perspective. And many folks need to have their eyes on both. So this particular list that comes up through the National Guideline Clearinghouse definitely crosses that line, and we can be uh, pretty sure that the the documents are written for clinicians, uh, but maybe for public health use, and vice versa, maybe written for public health use, but could be used in clinical planning. And that is just the nature of infectious disease planning. A similar would be with uh, sexually transmitted infections, for instance, or seasonal flu or pandemic flu planning. Um, I, what, is what is valuable about this particular clearinghouse is it does also include uh, the references for the um, for NICE, the British um, clearinghouse that Susan already mentioned. And I would want to refer you as well to think about the, the frameworks and strategies that are developed within Canada, typically by the federal government, often also by provinces. And sometimes there are also guidelines that have been developed by the professional associations or the regulatory colleges. So the similar, a similar kind of search has to go on, and then, as Susan said, you will need to determine whether they have already been uh, rigorously assessed, how the guidelines have come together, whether they were done through systematic review or some other uh, review process of the existing evidence. And all of, these, um, all of these documents will be of value to you as you move forward in your, um, in your finding the answers to your questions. Great, thanks, Margaret. Um, and so the idea with the pyramid is that you only go so far down the pyramid as you need to. So if you think back to the pyramid at the very bottom of it was single studies. If you're doing an evidence search and you find a great summary or maybe a few summaries or guidelines or best practice documents that really tell you everything you need to know, there's no obligation to look further at uh, syntheses or single studies. You stop where you need to stop 
or where you have um, found the answer to your question. And the value of the pyramid concept is that the, um, the sources that are at the top or toward the top of the pyramid have already been synthesized, meaning they've drawn from the bottom levels of the pyramid in producing their product. So guidelines draw from single studies and systematic reviews to develop those products. So they've done the work, you don't necessarily have to. So it might be that we would do the search on the guideline clearinghouse, as Margaret said, and there may be other sources that you would go to for best practice documents as well, professional associations, releases from the province or uh, at the federal level. And then you might stop because that would be um, good quality evidence that has been appraised, that you trust, and that gives you guidance about the particular scenario that you're in. If that's the case, fantastic, lucky for you because that work has been done for you and you can get to the process of applying this knowledge. But sometimes what we find is that those summaries are perhaps too general, um, not specific enough to the specific scenario that we're in. And so at that point, we move a little bit down the pyramid to go to that next level of evidence. So syntheses and synopsis of syntheses, I'll kind of talk about those middle bars together. A really good um, source for anyone who works in public health to know about um, if you're looking for syntheses is healthevidence.org, which is one of the sites listed, and I'm gonna show you that one in a second. When we're looking at syntheses, what we're going to find at that level of evidence is systematic reviews, meta-analyses, so you've probably heard those concepts, and um, systematic reviews are um, a systematic way, hence the name, to um, review a lot of research evidence from the bottom levels of the pyramid and pull it together in such a way that um, we can look across a number of studies and really be a little bit more confident about what's being found, what the evidence is showing about a particular topic. So let's take a look at health evidence now which uh, would be another site to be searching uh, for, for evidence, and in particular, um, systematic review evidence. So um, if you search on health evidence, this is what the, uh, the page looks like. And if you've used health, health evidence before, it's just had a face lift, so it looks a little bit different, um, but it works pretty much the same way. So. There's a big search box right in the middle there. You can just start typing in terms. So we might type in tuberculosis as a place to start. But in fact, I'm going to show you how to do an advanced search on health evidence um, because it can really, A, save you time, which is what we're all about, um, and also give you more precision in terms of the search that you're doing. So the screen would look something like this. So I typed in tuberculosis at the top as my overall keyword. And then um, I have some choices here. So I can choose if there are particular years. So maybe you just wanna see if something's come out in the last year or two. So you could restrict the years when it was published. Um, you can restrict in a number of different ways. What I did here was to restrict by intervention strategy and I chose screening from the drop-down menu, but there are other choices there as well that might apply to other scenarios. But if we're interested in screening, then we can um, narrow our search in that way. And if I do that search, so um, to submit that one, this is what happens. So it searches and returns six results. Now, my own response to this right away is, wow, I love that because um, if, if I just got one, I might kind of feel like maybe my search was too restrictive. Maybe I missed something that would still be helpful to me. If I got 100, I would feel like I was getting a lot of extraneous hits that probably were not on target for me. 
but I'd have to read through them all anyway, and that maybe isn't a good use of my time. But if I'm getting six, I feel like, first of all, I could read through those and do justice to them, at least you know, look at the titles and, and the quality rating, maybe even look at the abstracts and see if they were on target. Um, and um, it, it feels like I probably got some breadth in my search. Um, and this will really, the number of hits that you'll get will really vary depending on your topic, of course. So once you work in a field, you'll have a better sense of is six a lot or does six mean we're missing quite a few. But in this case, I would say for tuberculosis and screening, six probably feels about right to me. Um, so I've sorted these by date because when we're looking for evidence, we tend to want things that are the most recent. And that's particularly true for systematic reviews because systematic reviews are looking past over the past 10 or 20 or 50 years, depending on how they did the review. Um, so the more recent reviews um, will, will bring you up to date, perhaps, more than something that was published several years ago. It's not terrible, though, um, if there was something like the third one down um, by Kranzer to see something that was published in 2013, but seems from the title anyway to be pretty much on topic with what we're looking for. Um, if it's not a field where things are going to be changing a lot in the last three years, I would feel completely comfortable looking at data from uh, 2013 or maybe even a review from 2010. Um, in that case, if we're not finding anything that's really recent um, that's on target for us, we might then need to work our way down the pyramid and actually look for single studies that um, have been published in the last few years if you really want to be sure that you didn't miss anything. But in this particular case, Lucky us, we have a review that from the topic, or the title, sorry, um, seems to be on topic with what we uh, might be interested in. It's from 2016, you can't get more recent than that. And um, the quality rating here, this is um, being shown a little bit differently than how it used to be in health evidence. So if you're a returning user, you'll see something different. Um, the rating here is in terms of strong or moderate or poor, and we actually see examples of each of these here. So the green bars with the three bars, that's strong. It means um, that this review was done in a good way. So the folks at Health Evidence have looked at all these systematic reviews and used a checklist to say, did they do a systematic review the way you're supposed to do it? Did they do it well? So it's a quality appraisal, and in this case, um, that Curtis review that was published in 2016 is in fact considered to have been done well. So um, I would feel really um, happy about looking at that one because it's recent, it was well done, and it's on topic. And those are my criteria when I'm at this search stage. I want things that are on topic, as recent as I can get, synthesized, so I'm finding a systematic review here, which um, saves me time and brings a lot of evidence together, and that review was well done. Now, um, Margaret, I'll just ask you from your point of view, how well would um, this source or some of these sources um, address the scenarios that we're thinking about? Well, I think what we see from this uh, this particular example is that we have information here on different aspects of screening for tuberculosis, which may or may not be applicable to the inner city um, uh, population that we have in mind. So it is still worthwhile to have a look at each of the studies and see if they're useful for the, for the research question or the information that you are looking for evidence. Um, another example that I ran myself using a healthevidence.org, I used the word screen instead of screening. And that, of course, being a shorter word that, and it's a word portion, uh, it retrieved more documents. There were more to go through, but I found that it, it was actually more inclusive in some ways 
for uh, consideration of different screening methods or evaluations of screening programs. So when you're doing your search, I would just add the, the extra information that you might want to play with your search terms a little bit so that you, you feel confident that you have found all the documents that you might be looking for. Great, thank you. So absolutely, this is the case when you're searching is it's very rare that you do one search, you find what you're looking for, and then you move on. Um, you play with the key ter keywords a little bit, you adjust, you generally want to start broad and narrow only uh, so far as you feel comfortable that you're getting what you need and not missing everything. So um, as you're doing the search or if you're asking someone to do it for you, um, you know, you can expect this to, to be done in a few rounds and that's entirely um, expected and an appropriate way of doing it. Now, as I said, sometimes you feel like I just haven't quite found um, the right things at the systematic review level. Maybe there isn't a review on a particular topic that you're focusing on. Um, or there's a very specific population that you want to know about, or if you find a review that's good, but it's a little bit dated, um, you might go all the way to the bottom of the pyramid and start looking at studies, so what I call single studies, not, um, not uh, synthesized. Um, and so there are a few sites as well uh, that are listed here, Public Health Plus, which you can get to from nccmt.ca. Um, and those um, sources are pre-appraised single studies. Others that are not pre-appraised, which doesn't mean they're not good, it just means you have to do the work of appraising the quality, is through the TRIP um, database the best practices portal again. So uh, PubMed, of course, is kind of the, the granddaddy of them all if you're looking for health research. And um, PubMed can be a great source as well if you're looking for single studies. You'll find review th reviews there as well. Now one caution though, if you're looking at single studies, you will find a lot of them. If we found six reviews, just imagine how many single studies went into those reviews. So there may be a hundred single studies. There might be a thousand single studies that would be relevant to the topics that you're interested in. And the challenge, if you are moving all the way down the pyramid, which remember, you may not have to, but if you do, if you just pick out some of those hundred studies that you found, you're not being systematic anymore. Your cherry picking is a word that we use for it. So you just pick out some that you like the author because you've seen their work before, or you pick it out because you agree with the findings. Um, by, by choosing in that way, you're introducing bias into the findings that you're drawing from. And to be a good evidence user, you don't want bias to come into the evidence that you're looking at. So particularly important when you're looking at single studies that you look at everything that's relevant so that you can say that you were systematic. And this is why we really um, suggest that people first look for systematic reviews because there are other people somewhere at universities or in research institutes who are doing that work for you. Much better for them to do it and you just find those reviews and get busy um, applying them in your public health context. So in general, just to wrap up our discussion of searching, go to the highest possible level on the pyramid, use those pre-appraised sources so that you can be more efficient and not have to do the appraisal yourself. And if you want to know more about searching, um, there is an online module through NCCMT, through the Learning Center, um, that will take you through some of these skills in quite a bit more detail. 
Now we're moving on in our wheel, and the next step is appraise. And I've talked already about the importance of appraising. Here we're appraising the quality of the research methods that were used in the evidence that we're finding. And as I said, some of these um, evidence sites will already have done the appraisal for you. So that's awesome if that happens. Um, health evidence, for example, has already been appraised. Um, if not, then you need to do it. And the tools that we have here are appropriate for different kinds of evidence. So at the top, the agree to instrument is um, good for appraising practice guidelines. So was this guideline developed in a way that you can trust what they're saying? Or was there bias in it? The middle one, AMSTAR, is a way of assessing the quality of systematic reviews. So there are good ways and not so good ways of doing systematic reviews. Um, that's what those green and yellow and red bars are on health evidence. So there's a tool for that. The Critical Appraisal Skills Program has checklists for single studies that are using different kinds of research designs. So that may be of interest. And you may also want to review the evidence you're finding for other aspects, like um, sex and gender perspectives. And this is a, a tool I know that Margaret has had some experience with. So Margaret, I'll just ask you to comment on um, that tool at the bottom of that list. Yeah, so these, these two links uh, take, to, take you to two different uh, resources. Uh, given that, uh, the Canadian Institute for um, Health Research and many of the provinces now require documentation and explicit description of our populations based on their sex, the gender identification as well as the orientation, and often other equity and diversity considerations. These two resources can help you look at the evidence that you have and even if the information does not necessarily yet address these aspects, the, these two resources can help you formulate the questions that you might want to ask or use to describe other aspects of the population that you don't yet have evidence for. And not having the evidence for something is still important information to know. So we, um, we support these documents for their ability to help you work through a number of case studies and scenarios. One is an online, um, uh, online set of modules, and that's the SGBA resource. And the other is a, a workbook, both of which will help you take into consideration sex, gender, equity, and diversity in many different areas of health that you might be working in in your public health uh, work. So you might find that these are valuable as well as you appraise the evidence that you have, and it might help you go back into the search mode to look for additional evidence that you may have missed otherwise, or that is not yet described in a systematic review, but might be found in other kinds of documents. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's great and so important to think about. Um, and if you, if you cast your mind back to the, the Venn diagrams, the five overlapping circles, um, you know, this is part of what um, the implication of that model is, is that research is an important piece of our decision-making process, but it's not the only thing. And we also want to think about um, what information we have about particular populations and subpopulations. And, you know, let's be honest, sometimes the evidence that we would really like to have hasn't been done yet. Nobody's done that research. So um, we have to think about what we know from our expertise, from local practice, and so on. So we do absolutely want to bring in these um, determinants perspectives and equity perspectives as we uh, appraise evidence and as we, as we move forward to make decisions. So in this appraise step, it's a filtering step. And what we're looking for here is whether the evidence that we have found has bias inherent in it, and it answers the question, is this research or the review that we found of good enough quality that I should read further? So we're not looking here at whether we um, 
like the conclusion that they came to or the finding that they had. We're looking at the quality of their research method, their process, the way they did the review, which is different from whether we find their findings helpful. All research has flaws, so you're, you're never going to find research that doesn't have a little bit of bias in it. But some flaws are more serious than others. If you're finding flaw after flaw after flaw in a research um, paper, um, it might be a sign that you should not read further, not include that in your um, examination of evidence, because it's got too much bias in it. And if there's bias in your evidence, there will be bias in your conclusions. If you want to learn more about this appraisal process, which is pretty important for us as we're learning to um, use evidence effectively, there are online learning modules available at NCCMT. Um, and if you really are keen on this, there's a week-long course um, offered at McMaster about evidence-informed decision-making where there's a lot of focus on qualitative or uh, quality appraisal. Um, it usually happens in May, so you've missed it for this year, but that means you've got like 11 months to plan for next year. So um, you can check that out, and I'm not sure if the date is posted yet, but it's almost always the first week in May. So we're moving around the wheel now, and we're at the synthesize step. And in this step, we're saying, okay, we've um, found maybe a practice guideline, maybe we found a few systematic reviews that are of interest, maybe we even went to the single studies and found some things that are really specific to our populations, for example. Um, how do we bring it all together? Because, you know, sometimes people get a bit frustrated, you know. I found, like, I found one thing saying this, and I found another one saying that, and I don't know who to believe. You can hear this on the radio all the time, right? You know, today they're saying uh, red wine is good for you. Last week red wine was bad for you. And, you know, people kind of make fun of science a little bit sometimes because it seems like it's contradictory. So it can be a little bit of a challenge to figure out what to do to pull a number of different findings together. That's what the synthesize step is all about. So we have a tool to recommend for this step, and it's called a briefing note tool. So I'm sure all of you have seen briefing notes uh, in the past. Um, you may have a template already for a briefing note, and, and that's great. But if you don't, or you may just want to take a look at what this briefing note template um, can help you do, it really is focused on creating briefing notes that will be useful for decision makers. So the focus is not only bringing the evidence together, but developing actionable messages. What does it tell us about what we should do in our programs or our policies? So um, it, this is what the template looks like, and you can sort of fill in and check boxes and so on with your own information from the search that you've done of the evidence. Um, this is, can just be a really helpful structure if you're finding, okay, I've got this stack of evidence or a number of articles that I've looked at, but I don't know how to summarize it and give it to my manager or share it with my team. Um, so this structure may be helpful in that regard. When you're synthesizing, you want to be sure that you're drawing on good quality evidence. So you've already done that appraisal step and you've only included those things that are trustworthy, good enough quality. You're trying to figure out what were their results and what does it mean for the scenarios that you're finding yourself in. When we find results that conflict, um, often it's the case that it's not actually that two studies were done exactly the same way and they got conflicting results. Often we can say that one of the studies or one of the reviews um, was of better quality, and therefore we would prefer that one. Um, reviews that are more recent tend to take more studies into account, so we would tend to prefer the more recent ones. 
and things that are really on target, more relevant to your question, your population, that really gets to the heart of the matter. So once you start to uh, find your way through the different um, characteristics of all the evidence you have, you may see some reason to prefer or to believe um, some of them over another. You still may have some conflicts and you may have to say, we don't know for sure. That's part of living in the real world and it just means that there's more research that may need to be done. What we're focusing on here is the actionable findings. So if we need to make a decision about what to do or what not to do or what to stop doing, well, what does the guideline say? What does that review tell us? What additional information can we bring into it to help us make those decisions that we need to make? Now, research evidence is um, at the heart of taking an evidence-informed approach to decision-making. But um, we're not tied only to research evidence. We also need to adapt that information to our local community. And that's where this model comes back into play. So we looked at this earlier to say that the research is involved. Um, but there are also questions about, well, if there's a suggestion in the research that, you know, maybe screening done in this way is, um, is effective for identifying um, people who need um, treatment for tuberculosis. Um, well, is that going to work in our local context? What preferences do people have for how that's done? What else is going on in the community? Because um, maybe someone is already doing something similar. Can we afford to do it? What's been our experience and what expertise do we bring to it? So we ask all of these questions before we make our decision. And there are some tools here, um, two of them, and they're actually quite similar to guide you in um, applying and transferring evidence from more general research context into your own world, your own setting. So one of the tools is called, it worked there, will it work here? And it really is just a series of questions to ask about um, what we know so far and what your local circumstance is. And then below that, is this evidence useful to me? It's actually a tool that's based on the first tool, but it has some more content related to um, health equity and vulnerable populations. So in this scenario, and perhaps in others as well, that second tool may be of particular interest. There's an online learning module for this as well, so um, if this is an area that you really feel you need to dig into a little bit more, um, that ADAPT stage, there's a module for you at uh, nccmt.ca. So in this ADAPT stage, you're thinking about all of those aspects in the Venn diagram, the research evidence, but other things too, and you're asking the question, We've got all these potential interventions out there, or we've got some suggestion that the research evidence is pointing to this to be a good intervention, it's effective, it's giving the outcomes that we're interested in. But we're asking, can it be adapted for our community, given the services we already have, given the population that lives here, given the funding that we have, and so on. So there's no perfect answer to this. It's more like, it's more on the art side than the science side, I would say, um, but really important to be um, thinking about research evidence in a context, and that's really what happens at the ADAPT stage. Now we're at the implement stage, so we're really making our decision here, deciding whether to implement a change and to plan how to do that. And of course, there's a whole field of study that is called implementation science that looks at this aspect of bringing evidence into practice and saying, how do we actually create change and make it sustainable? Um, how do we get people on board, um, which can really be important? 
So um, I'll ask Margaret to talk about this tool for um, implementation that really has to do with outreach. Oh, just the, this is one tool that you can find uh, through the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools, but also, of course, through our own website. Uh, it was developed with uh, urban uh, sexually transmitted infection programs in mind, but when we were reviewing it for the purposes of today, we realized it's equally adaptable for use if we're looking, uh, thinking about inner city residents and tuberculosis. And it is, uh, this, this is just a schema, but it, the intent is to use the information and evidence that you have, the planning that you're planning to do, and then ensure that you're taking the steps that you need to reach the population that you have in mind that you're mandated to, to talk with and um, helps you move through the steps of ensuring that they are suitably involved and that the program meets their needs. Um, I did want to say as well that in the, referring to tuberculosis specifically, one of the projects that NCCID will be working on in the coming year is a depiction and a visualization of a patient journey through tuberculosis, both from the clinical and the public health side. And we will be using the depiction um, of the actual steps that a patient and his or her uh, clinicians and the programs around him or her are working but also the performance measures, because there are new performance measures for tuberculosis uh, developed in the States and Canada that many people are interested in. So it would be a way to demonstrate the implementation of a program and the clinical path as it relates to a patient in one jurisdiction. So just a bit of a heads up of something that's coming, but to demonstrate that you can apply these very different tools in different ways that will uh, meet the needs of your program for your population. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, thanks, Margaret. That's great. And you know, just looking at this model, um, it, it really, um, you know, the steps in here are um, certainly aligned with the model that we're talking about in terms of, um, you know, similar approach. Although here it's about getting to know your population and working with people as opposed to getting to know your evidence and working with that. But the steps are really quite analogous, um, which is kind of interesting to see and, and conceptually it makes perfect sense that, that the steps would kind of follow. Um, so that's really helpful and um, uh, helpful to know about. And, um, uh, and good to know about things that are almost out as well because some were sort of cutting edge. Now the last step in our wheel um, that we'll talk about, but of course remember it's a wheel, so we always have more questions and we always keep going. But at this step, we're evaluating how effective we were at using evidence to direct our decisions, our changes in practice or policy. So it's certainly possible to think about evaluating outcomes for our patients or our population, but we can also kind of be self-reflective about it and evaluate how good we were at using evidence. And really, we've been talking about that evidence use process throughout this webinar, so there are ways that you can prompt yourself to think about that process of using evidence. So we have a tool to recommend for this step, it's called Improving Future Decisions, Optimizing the Decision Process from Lessons Learned, and the link is there. It's a reflective practice tool that will help you to just um, learn from your process of finding and using evidence. This is what it looks like. It looks like the one I um, showed you for the briefing note, but it's actually different. It's just, um, it has some similarities because they both come from health evidence. Um, so here, uh, right in the middle of the page, you'll see that it prompts you to think about what your decision process was. So, you know, we had decided maybe to implement a certain screening approach, but maybe that didn't actually happen. And you can reflect on why and why not. Um, what would we do differently? What didn't work? Um, all of those kinds of questions that we ask ourselves quite naturally as we debrief or think about certain approaches. Um, but it's helpful to have it all captured here. 
Um, and the other thing that's great about this tool is that if you actually take the time to write some of this down, even really quickly, um, it is so helpful for people who come two, three, four years from now. Maybe everybody on that team has gotten a new job and moved on. Um, it's just a way of condensing some of the history in terms of what we were trying to do in being good evidence users and making good decisions about our programs, um, but recognizing that we don't have all the answers and we still have things to learn. And this is one way of just capturing some of that process experience. So when you're evaluating how effective you were at using an evidence-informed approach, you're going to think about things like what was your process, uh, who was involved, how could you do better next time, how will you know whether people actually changed their practice? Sometimes we have a great idea. I've certainly been in those situations where we think, oh, yeah, you know, we should do that. But then it just never really takes off. Um, so it was a good idea, and for whatever reason, just didn't happen. This prompts you to think about what's really happening and how we need to pay attention to those implementation steps to be sure that people are supported in making changes to those really effective interventions that we're finding through the evidence. Sometimes that means that we need to gather baseline data about what were people doing before in their public health practice, and then we can look to see what the, the change is um, once we've implemented our evidence-based intervention. So that was a pretty quick trip through these seven steps with methods and tools at each step to help you do um, evidence-informed public health decision-making. Our focus here was on infectious disease relevant resources, some of them quite specific to infectious disease and others that are um, sort of generic but certainly could be applied to that um, context and applied to our scenario. So um, let's hear from you. I'd really love to hear whether there are methods and tools that perhaps you've used before and you can um, give us more information in the Q&A question about ways that you've found to structure your use of evidence um, or questions that you have. We're happy to see those as well. So um, let's see what we're seeing here. So um, lots of people saying I've heard of one or more of the methods and tools. A couple of you have used one of the methods and tools and we'd love to hear about your experience um, with that. A couple not familiar, so some learnings for you, which is great as well. Probably the majority of people are saying I've heard of one or more of the methods and tools, but perhaps some learnings there too. So um, as, as you may imagine, we're sort of heading into our question and answer session. So um, if you have questions or comments, you can start using the Q&A box to um, type those in. Um, I did want to draw your attention while you're doing that to one other recommended tool, and this is called the Evidence-Informed Decision-Making Checklist. It goes through those same steps that we talked about, um, but really summarized on one page. So if you just want a quick summary of um, those steps, the define, the search, and so on, you, and um, it's kind of nice because it gives you an opportunity to check off after you've done things, so it can be kind of satisfying to say, okay, I am making progress through these steps. So um, check that out if you're looking for a pretty quick uh, review of that process of evidence-informed decision-making. And you can find it on nccmt.ca. All the, the links are there. So another question for you as, as you're thinking of questions for us. Um, to what extent would you say that the methods and tools described today will be useful in your practice? That's good feedback for us. We want it to be useful, but give us a sense of uh, the extent to which you think this will be useful in the practice. Okay, so fantastic. Lots of people saying very useful, 65%, um, something like that. So um, happy to hear that and, and 
other things somewhat useful, so that's good too. Um, terrific. Thank you so much for that input, and we're happy to hear that. Questions. You can use the Q&A to post your comments or questions, and feel free to send all the questions to everybody um, so that people can see. Um, so we're interested um, what's going to happen for you next. What are your next steps? And you can check more than one here if that's um, important. So maybe you're going to access one of these methods and tools um, or read an NCCMT summary that you'll find on the registry so that you'll know a bit more about methods and tools that are out there. Maybe you'll consider using it in practice or tell a colleague. That's always a good way of approaching as well. So that's, um, that's terrific. Thanks for uh, thinking about all of those things. And we're seeing good um, uptake on accessing the tools or thinking about using them in practice. Telling your colleagues word of mouth is always great. So that's terrific. I'm glad to hear that there are some things of interest here. Um, if you want all these links, of course, it may be nice for you to have the PowerPoint slides, and they will be available on our SlideShare account in English and French. Um, and then the recording of today's session will be available in English on our YouTube account. So um, for anyone who would like the more permanent record, it is there for you. We also have a survey, so evaluation is really important. We like to um, hear your input uh, so that we can do better next time. So right after we close today, that link will come up, and we really are very happy to hear your feedback. Um, and we're going to go to questions uh, right after this, but I just want to draw your attention to um, a webinar that's coming up in a couple of weeks. I will be talking about similar content but applied to injury prevention. So if you know someone who works in the injury prevention field and who might like um, a bit of a walkthrough or a review of evidence-informed decision-making processes, June 22nd. Um, and you can see the link there. So we'd be happy to um, see other folks on that webinar. So our contact information is there. And um, so let's see what kinds of questions we may have. So people were asking about whether they can, um, whether they can get the uh, slides. And so yes, you can through our slideshare.net account for NCCMT. So um, let's hear from you. What other, um, what are, have been some of your experiences or what are some of the questions that you may have about using evidence in the fields that you're working in? Margaret, maybe I'll ask you a question just while people are thinking. Um, in terms of approaches to evidence use for um, for infectious disease, um, you, you gave a little bit of a, a hint of um, one of the tools that may be forthcoming. But um, can you talk about um, some uh, anything else uh, exciting that people should watch for from NCCID? Well, thanks, Susan. So we work in a number of areas. We have uh, quite a lot of information that is available for folks uh, related to HIV and other STIs, other sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections. And we work very closely with public health, uh, such as Katy and some of the other national organizations, as well as with provincial and more regional health authority, public health personnel in um, grassroots organizations, so those who are really doing the outreach to potential and, and uh, existing patients. We also have a whole area of work related to influenza, including explanations of how to understand the notion of burden of disease. And in all of these cases, we have uh, quite technical reviews of evidence, the sort of things that Susan's been talking about, where we've appraised the evidence and um, collected it together in a synthesis or summary. But we also have some plain language materials that are available for a quick read, quick reference, particularly if you're developing a policy brief. 
newer work that we're going into is related to TB, as I mentioned, with some new products coming out. And we're just starting to pull together the evidence and information that you may find helpful when you're thinking about uh, newcomers, particularly refugees, um, particularly right now when we, when we know that there are a number, a, a great number of refugees coming into Canada and many, um, many public health personnel in the cities, for instance, don't quite yet feel prepared and know what their public health needs will be. Finally, an area that we work in is uh, antimicrobial resistance. And that is both in terms of surveillance and making sure those surveillance data are available for public health, but also for stewardship. And we'll be developing some new products that will be coming out, including a non-prescription pad for nurse practitioners and prescribing doctors to use with patients when a, an antibiotic is not the right uh, prescription, but still some other kind of care is, is still value. So that's just a, a, a bit of a rundown of some of the resources that we have available at nccid.ca. That's terrific, and I love that idea, a non-prescription pad. Mm -hmm. That's clever. It's one of our most popular resources. I bet it is. Yeah, that's great. Good. Well, if we have no other questions, then we can wrap it up for today. If you're looking for more information, of course, you can go to our websites at nccmt.ca and nccid.ca. Um, or contact us directly at um, the email address is there. Um, I'm Susan, my colleague is Margaret, and those emails will find their way to us if you um, indicate that it was something specific to this webinar. So we'd love to hear from you about questions or um, methods and tools or practice issues that you have related to infectious disease. So thanks so much for participating today, and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody.